flexes a little bit. Um, uh, and the early cars flex a lot more than the later cars. So, you know, trying to um, fix a car and then align all the body panels and then you do that on the rotisserie and then you put it on the floor and then it moves a little bit and you have to realign everything. It's a very challenging uh, process to go through. Um, but we got pretty good. The car runs pretty well. Um, every single part of the car has been touched. Um, I think one of the only things that we didn't have to do much to was the wiring harness. We just replaced rubber ends on it and cleaned it. Uh, the, the, the wiring from, from that vintage seems to hold up pretty well. But the engine was completely rebuilt. Uh, the old three main bearing engines have a uh, crankshaft with plugs in that screw in and they don't have oil filters. So, you know, those engines generally will, will go bad about every 100,000 miles or less, 80 to 100,000 miles, uh, because the crankshafts fill up with the grit that centrifuges out of the oil as the engine's running because it doesn't have an oil filter. So we um, cleaned all that stuff, and uh, this engine should last a lot more miles than Lance and Mikhail will probably ever drive it, uh, hopefully. And uh, went through the transmission. Um, pretty straightforward. The um, um, hydraulic system, these early cars had uh, LHS or brake fluid if they came to the U.S. and we converted it to LHM, the green fluid that is in all the later cars. Um, that was also a, a big topic of discussion as to what would be uh, the most correct or keep the car the most valuable or which way to go. Um, Brake fluid was um, had problems in corrosion and making uh, the hydraulic units fail. If you had a leak, the paint uh, brake fluid leak it gets on the uh, paint it can pull the paint off. It's really good paint remover. So um, uh, in the long run, we decided to um, go to LHM because it's a very uh, it's, you can get seals for it. And, uh, Cars are very reliable, and they still use it. You know, they used it for many, many more years than they did brake fluid. Uh, but doing that, some of the old hydraulic components on the car were, um, uh, didn't necessarily make uh, correct seals, so we had to make stuff work on that. Um, and then, let's see. Um, you know, a lot of extra hydraulics with Citromatic. That's always a challenge to you. Um, but, uh, I think we got that working out real well. We kept, we, we had a lot of discussions about whether we should paint the hydraulic units black or green. And all these cars came with black hydraulic units from uh, when, if they were brake uh, through cars to begin with. And uh, we decided to keep that that way. And then. Uh, just put uh, the sign that's on the hydraulic tank so you don't need to run through it because that would not grow up <laughs> if you did. Uh, well, we tried in making all these types of decisions to look at the future and keep in mind what would help improve the value of the car and uh, try to keep that all in mind along with what would be best for uh, running of the car. Uh, this car looks really nice, but it's going to be driven. And to drive a car, you know, it's got to run good. You can't break it down everywhere. Uh, so it's, it's, you have to keep that in mind when you're restoring it. Yeah, pick my Let's see. Oh, okay, so after the uh, after the the chassis was finally all welded together, we uh, we sent it to Ensign Auto Body in Latham, New York. And they, they painted the chassis, that's what these pictures are here. The car was still on the rotisserie. The body was not on it. Um, it was painted inside and out, upside down, every which way. They had two guys on it spraying paint for about eight hours to get the whole car done. Um, multiple coats of epoxy primer and a urethane paint. So the chassis should be really well sealed for forever. Obviously, it's never going to be driven in the winter or anything like that. Probably never in the rain. Never know. Um, uh, so 
after you get your chassis done, then we could start building the car back up. Um, when you do that, you know, you have to, cars are built in layers. Uh, so you've got to figure out what goes into the car first, and that's always challenging because Citroens have a lot of layers. Um, so we got work through that, putting the suspension on and rebuilding everything along the way, all the brakes. Um, we uh, rebuilt or made a whole bunch of new hydraulic lines. Eventually, got to a point where we had a chassis that could roll around. Uh, the, uh, and, um, you know, the one picture over there, we had uh, with uh, number 11 there. There's um, replumbing the car was time consuming, and that was also a challenge. And what, what should we do with the hydraulic lines? The original lines had like a copper color of the coating on them. And new lines that you get don't necessarily look that way. And what we ended up doing was a lot of the lines were in good shape. We cleaned them and then sealed them or painted them like with a, a 70 clear, so hopefully they won't rust in the future or anything. And then we found this Kupernol uh, type of brake line which is looks coppery colored and very easy to work with and we made hydraulic lines that we couldn't uh, reuse out of that. So, um, uh, you know, it's pretty time consuming to go through the whole, all the lines on the whole car, make them look the way they did, and attach them all. The hydraulic lines, they can't vibrate or move around because they'll break. Um, so you have to be very careful. We, Carter, my upper Carter is really, really into the parts books and he's a detail guy. <laughs> So, um, you know, you, if we needed to know, if we didn't have a picture, we took thousands of pictures of the car as it came apart, but if we didn't uh, know how a part was supposed to be from our pictures, he could go into the parts book and try to figure out what the part was and where it was attached and how it was attached, and, you know, hopefully we came up with that. Uh, got, it, got all that stuff in the right position. It's really important to get all that. The hydraulic lines in the right position. If they rub against each other, you'll have a failure. They stuck out in the road. You get enough people looking at you, just drive it. Just you don't want to looking at it because you're spewing fluid everywhere. Um, <laughs> um, we also, in uh, doing a, a project like this, we have, we have to act like a general contractor to build a house. And you have a bunch of different things being done all at the same time. While, while we were working on parts, parts that we could do, we had things out at the machine shop being machined. We had parts out being replated or re-chromed. Um, there's a lot of parts on the car that got powder coated, mainly because it was cheaper and it lasted a really long time. It was just like paint. Um, so that uh, it worked really well, so we had that stuff being done. Pete Bandy from Michigan had the leather, uh, redid all the leather seats and door panels. Um, we have a local guy, uh, John Nisselbeck, working on the top. Um, actually, you've not seen the top up yet. That's because the top's not done. <laughs> so, uh, and that's why we have a big tent. Uh, but um, fortunately, we've had a couple of really nice days of weather and plants of the tail have been able to drive it. And running quite well. Um, trying to coordinate all these parts and pieces from the machine shop and the upholstery shop and the top shop and the paint shop and the, everybody, all to get them to come in and mesh all at the same time is very, very difficult uh, on a job like this, especially if you have a deadline. And this was sort of our deadline. I mean, we could have picked any day. But uh, we really wanted to try to get it here uh, for Father's Day for him. <laughs> and uh, we do have the car, so that he's driving on this, and uh, uh, we look to drive it. There's lots of cool pictures here. Uh,
we can start it up in a minute. Okay. Um, you know, one other thing about assembling a car like this, especially when it's from, you get multiple people working on it in different areas, putting it all together, it's really, really challenging to get all the pieces to fit together. Like, uh, yeah, it can be difficult to tell. Um, just trying to get the window winder handles to fit with new, um, new work cards, with thicker leather, you know, <laughs> maybe even the paint sticker. It takes forever to get the window winder handles. Everything is a challenge. Um, there's many parts on the car that are really unique to the Chopin convertibles. They're very, very expensive, very, very rare, but really, really hard to get. Um, it turns out, like, the, these pieces here, this long one on each side of the car, they were crushed completely. And we couldn't, we didn't think they could be fixed. So, there's an old guy, I guess he's like 80 years old in Germany, that makes them. So, it took them like six months to, to make them. And, because he's really, he's 80, he wants to retire. You know? yeah, I think there's people around that can do it, but those are like the only two pieces of reproduction trim that are on the car. All the rest of the trim um, had dents in it or scratches or holes in it. I spent, we've got a TIG welder, some of the stainless steel, I, there were holes from the screws that we put through them. I pounded them out, welded them up. Uh, with the take uh, with stainless steel filler on here and we ground them and polished them. They're all back on the car. You know, you can see little little imperfections in them, but they and they could be taken to the next level. But we're not trying to win Pebble Beach with this car. We're trying to have a really, really nice car. It's a really, really nice car. But um, that's just some of the effort that goes into some pieces like that. Uh, we um, I think this, this car was in at least one crash in its life, maybe two, and it didn't have the correct rear bumper on it. Uh, this, the original D model bumper is about this long. We were able to find a, um, a real Chitron lower bumper half yeah, from Duck Benfield in Colorado. And the deck foot that was on the car had like these two inch waves that the fiberglass had. <laughs> and it wasn't really fixable. And Doug also had a deck foot, so we, we tried to make that fit. And it was good. But trying to, you know, the other option was in Europe they're making uh, carbon fiber replacement deck foots for 35 inch foot. So, um, you know, this is an original Chevron deck foot, so we stuck with that and got that to work. Questions. How did you weld the rear clip on if the frame had already been painted? That's, yeah, that was painted all the way. It was painted all the way around, and then they just ground where they were going to spot the weld. Or, or, or just touch it up. Yeah, that's right. And then after after the body was welded back on, then we went back up in all the cracks and crevices and repainted up in there as we could. The other thing that we did, the whole car will eventually be fluid film to keep it from rusting. But for now, we've just sprayed fluid film in the uh, quarter panels in the doors because they're pretty much sealed up for, for good now uh, in the front fenders. But we're going to do the frame later. Uh, there's a little more to go on the car, but it's, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, it's probably 95, 98% How many of uh, how many are still around in this uh, I believe there was eleven hundred or thirteen hundred. Thirteen hundred and they were made over a fifteen year period. Uh, and there's not many left. Well, if there's half of them, that might be a lot of them. And each one kind of started out as a four door sort of wow. Dave, you said this is a DS nineteen? Uh, obviously, then there's a difference between this and the ID19, which I didn't know there was a DS19. I thought it was an ID19 or a DS21 and up. Can you elaborate on that car? The first D series car was a DS19 from 1956. In late 1957, the ID19 was released as a less expensive and less complicated model of the DS. 
it didn't have the automatic clutch and hydraulic shifting system, had a simplified braking system, um, and much less luxurious appointments. The first Chapon convertible was 1961, and it was based, the factory convertible, it was based on a, on a DS-19. The ID-19 was offered as a cabriolet also. Very few were built because you wouldn't necessarily want to start off with a, a, an inexpensive car that didn't have luxurious appointments and make it into a cabriolet. But they do exist. The DS-21 came on the market in 1967, 1966, and it most, it's similar to a DS-19 but with a bigger engine and some other technical modifications. That's interesting. Thank you. But this is the museum. This is a DS-19 museum <coughs> cabriolet. Okay. And the difference between, is that a, 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 a toned down cabriolet? Or no, it, it means that it was approved by the factory and given the factory serial number. Chacon made coach-built cars in other versions also, right. but they were not necessarily, they weren't called Superlands. Exactly. This was from the old days of coach builders and the way they would buy a chassis and modify it to the, to the customer's specifications. Right. But these were a, sort of a, a cast in stone design that Citroën approved and they were sold through Citroën dealers. Okay. Which parts were powder coated? A lot of stuff under the Is the sheet metal that's not part of the sedan, the chevron came down in that house? I, they, yes. Um, they, they did. I don't know if they stamped. You know, they stamped the bottom. The, it was, it was formed. Madame Chapron told me that it was formed over wooden forms by hand for each car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's yeah. And it's uh, interesting that, um, Andre on the windshield on this car, is it taller than a normal V? Standard DS windshield? Okay. And all cabriolets are, are like that? All using cabriolets. Okay. There were some special cartons that had a lower windshield. So cars like the Le Paris. Yeah. yeah. That's a different windshield. Um, the regular sedan has removable quarter panels. This here I see from the, those photos that it's all one piece. You have the whole wheel clip. It's all one piece. That's right. Um, Chapron, when they, when they made it, they were weld seeing, which if, if you look at I don't know if it's in any of these photos, but when we had it uh, soda blast, if you could see a hand well going down right about here and one here. Uh, so it was basically a removable thing that was welded together. Well, yeah. well, uh, and the doors are longer than a regular D door. And right about here, there's a seam that they took two doors and made one long. No, okay, that's not going to be my next question. Well, the door is longer because it's a two door. And you might even be able to see on the inside a little bit some of the, the weld, but they were really, really good welders. So I think they did most of it with a torch. And, uh, didn't warp it. It's just really hard. The weld was just budded? They were not overlapped? No, just budded together. Yep. They were real hard. Real fast. Yeah. They overheated the metal. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, thank you. Congratulations to them. They, you know, if the Hellmans didn't, uh, didn't have the foresight, well, if Lance didn't have the foresight to buy this car 40 years ago and save it all that time, yeah. uh, you know, he wouldn't be around. I passed one of these up for 600 bucks in 1980. <laughs> <laughs>
He's, he had the smarts to do it. I didn't. Yeah. I, I had owned uh, 20 or 30 Citroën, but I never owned a, a convertible. So uh, I've been looking around the Northeast for them, and I found them in better shape that I couldn't afford, or horribly rusty that I thought weren't worth saving. So uh, this this one um, was bought under under duress. The last thing I needed was another car, but I really wanted a convertible. And uh, I ha I found this little note card that that where I listed where all the money came from to buy it. And I, I've worked part-time uh, on Citroëns and some other cars. And I wrote $50 from so-and-so, $200 from my cash advance or my Visa card. <laughs> so it cost, 38 years ago, it cost me a total of around $800. And I wrote at the bottom of this note card, don't spend more money on this car. <laughs> for 38 years, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so Ma Michaela, three years ago, said, Dad, you've got to get this restored. You know, it's been in the back of my barn for, for about 20 years. And she offered to begin to pay for the restoration. So that that launched it. That, that launched the, the process. So I've taken over paying much. Peter Bandy, where I saw him here a second ago. Peter, he did the leather interior. As, as David said, local shop, Henson, the bodywork, David's shop, massive amount of stuff. Uh, I had a friend here very briefly today who was with Michaela and myself when we picked the car up after my divorce was final. <laughs> a very terrible trip driving back from Bristol, Vermont to Boston where I lived at that time because I very stupidly drove it with the gas that had been in the gas tank for five or ten years. So clogged up the fuel pump, clogged up the carburetor, and we were in a rainstorm in the middle of the night and then the starter quit working. And it was uh, quite an ordeal. So I have pictures of Michaela when she was eight when we uh, when we picked up the car. So it's been in the family. I haven't I can't say I've enjoyed owning it. I like knowing we had it, but I never really got, every time I drove it from one parking spot to the other over the years was uh, very stressful. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of amazing thing to see it complete after so long. So I appreciate the various people whose input ended up reassembling this. Because if you remember, as David said, it was just a chassis here two years ago, 2003 years ago, just the bare chassis on the rotisserie here. It didn't look much like a car. <laughs> Is this original color? Yeah, Rouge Ruby. We, we tried very hard to get the original color, so we think we think this, this is it. Um, the, the shop uh, last fall, Michaela and I went with Dave to the shop. I hope that the body shop, if they met the father and daughter and work with Dave, they'd be extra careful and get it done on time. That didn't happen. <laughs> the extra careful happened, but they they looked at the uh, a painted piece under the steering wheel that they felt had never been exposed to light, and they tried very hard to duplicate that. And I was they they spray painted a kind of funny car model. And uh, David sent that to me. We took that to the shop. And, you know, look, look. I, I do some artwork, so it looked as close as I thought was humanly possible. And they tried very hard. So, yeah, I think that, I think this is it. This is the, this is the color. The, we had intended to have two different uh, front ends on it from my parts collection. The normal American uh, front end fenders with their lights. But I had stripped a car that was assembled in Belgium with the European lighting system. So that, that's what we're using right now. They happen to be the best fenders of all the ones that we had to work with. So we just picked those first to get because it was easier. And even those, they looked really good. There was hours and hours of cutting and welding out. Because once you strip them, all the, all the corruption shows up. <laughs> Are those fenders identical to the sedan? Yes. Perfect.
the story is that originally uh, Chevron wanted the factory to supply him the basic the basic cars so he could create the convertibles. They weren't interested, so he had to buy complete cars and then convert them into a convertible. But when they saw them, the Citroën approved of that, and they supplied him uh, uh, maybe the state later the station wagon chassis, which is a little stronger. And then he did his work on that. So if you look at some old books, you'll see uh, him being supplied basically with the chassis and everything from here on that was the same. But as, as Dave said, when, when we had these doors apart, you could see the weld where they cut these two doors and created this, uh, the uh, vertical door slightly longer. Yeah, in that ride back from uh, Bristol, Vermont, practically 38 years ago, during that horrible rainstorm, Michaela fit in the back seat so she could sleep here. <laughs> she doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> Do you have any questions of, from me about it? Do you know the original ownership and history of the car? We're the second owners. Michaela and I are the second. The, mm -hmm. the, the first owners owned a uh, the electric company in Osable, New York, and they had it. They bought it from New York City, and they had it worked on in Montreal. Yeah. And I, all, all the years I had it, we've had it. I never realized the bumper was wrong. <laughs> you know, they had a sedan bumper because they, they lost the bumper and they replaced it with a sedan bumper. So when it came to restoration and trying to do everything to make it original, as Dave said, we had to go and search to get a. Authentic chaperone bumper that would wrap wrap around the back of the car here. Any other questions for me or for, for Dave? Do you want to introduce yes. Madame? No, well. Madame. Introduce you. She didn't want to be She want to be Okay. Sorry. David, have a treat. This is your badge. Where's your front license? No. The floor. I'm not putting my front license plate until they stop me. There she is. She's there. She's there. Very nice. Building all these cars and wow. really yeah. you know,